Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. As children, it's very natural. You'll just fill in the gaps because you're so curious about everything and the world is just a huge giant adventure box. And by the time you get to be an adult, the world is different. And, you know, I don't want to be cynical, but maybe you're looking for a way out of the <laughs> of the situation. There can be a danger that at times, unless delicately managed, that introduction of formal education can close down possibilities. So many of the things that we think are fun are really over taxing our dopamine system, right? Welcome back to an all new season of What Happens Next. We're kicking our eighth season off with a fun one. Fun itself, or rather, play. Any educator worth their salt can tell you that play is an essential aspect of human development. When children play, it fosters creativity, social skills, and problem-solving abilities. But our adult world places a high value on productivity, and we're up against some extremely serious challenges. In the face of this, play is often seen as a waste of time or even a luxury. Today, we're talking to world-leading experts in music, creativity, psychology, and even video games about play's critical role in our individual and collective well-being. What happens when we stop playing? And what happens when we let our creative muscles atrophy? Keep listening to find out what happens next. All of us are born with a creative streak. In fact, many experts argue that the groundwork for innovation and ingenuity is being laid even before we leave the womb. The sense of hearing is the first sense to develop in utero. And there are studies that have um, explored the music that young children hear or infants hear whilst they are in the womb Mm. and have demonstrated that those children or infants are able to recognise that music. So even in the womb, they are developing musical tastes, they're developing a musical vocabulary, a repertoire of music and song. So it's It's there from the very earliest moments. Professor Margaret Barrett is a music educator and head of the Sir Zelman Cowan School of Music and Performance at Monash University. A lot of my research has focused around very young children. So the the youngest child enrolled in one of my research projects was six weeks. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So it's been looking at the way music occurs in families with very young children. And it started from an initial research project where I was uh, studying young children, five-year-olds, four, five-year-olds, invented notations. Mm. So how they make up notations to record their music. And one of the questions that I asked in that process of the child was, do you ever make up your own music? And invariably they said, of course I do. And they would then sing me their own songs. <laughs> and so immediately I thought, well, here are children presenting at school, four and five years of age, singing their own songs, inventing their own songs. Where does that start? Mm. So my next study looked at children between 18 months of age and up to school looking, does it start here? And of course, yes, there's a lot that happens there. And the next study was looking at children from birth onwards. And so looking at the way in which music is is part of being human, the way in which we draw on music as parents, as children, to make meaning of the world, to engage with the world, to explore the world. Music is very much built into being a human. It is perhaps what makes us human. Dr Xavier Ho, a lecturer in Monash University's Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture, says play helps us discover who we are, who our friends are, what we like to do and what our world is like. 
you know, play is something that people do naturally. Um, kids play, mm. right? You know, children go out to play and they play at home. They play with their friends. Um, they play to learn, right? So there is a sense of uh, we often uh, learn by imitating action. And sometimes we are learning the rules of play, how societies work, uh, who you are in society, who you want to be in mm. the future. You're learning through play. You're learning through role play, right? You're trying to follow models. You're trying to find people who you connect. You're trying to find the sort of industry, the sort of work that you enjoy doing, the sort of art that you enjoy picking up as a hobby, mm. you know, the sort of spare time thing that you like doing, learning through play. So what is the role of play? Play is how we become who we are. Somewhere along the way from childhood to adulthood, however, we lose something. Here's Margaret again. The children with whom I've worked, they're all musical. They, they are all interested and engaged with music. And indeed, if anything, where I see young children begin to disengage is in that shift to formal education, where sometimes the structures of formal education close down the invention and the experimentation because early formal education is bent on developing repertoire, learning songs. So I've had young children with whom I've worked who say, oh, I don't sing songs anymore because I can't remember the words and I don't know how it goes. But these were young children with whom several months to a year before when I was working with them, they were inventing their own. They Lots of words, lots and lots of invention that was going on. So there can be a danger that at times, unless delicately managed, that introduction of formal education can close down possibilities. Hi, I'm Rob Walker. I'm a writer living in New Orleans, the author of the book, uh, The Art of Noticing, and the related newsletter of the same name. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Why do you think adults in particular struggle so much to play? Well, because <laughs> because it seems childish. Um, you know, because uh, we grow up, we grow out of these, uh, you know, curious mindsets, we get serious. And it's good that we do this. Like if the entire society, if entire societies were made up of people who had childlike mindsets and uh, maybe sometimes we feel that they are, uh, you know, it'd be a disaster. Like we need people to be able to concentrate and, um, focus and uh, pay attention to, to serious matters. So as a result of that, you quote unquote, put aside childish things, right? And one of those childish things is that sort of curiosity and openness and playfulness. It just seems silly. We leave play behind as we grow older and more serious, but also as our diaries fill up. Here's Xavier. You mentioned that kids play. Do you think adults play enough? Oh, adults totally play as well, for sure. But play enough, interesting, right? So uh, I used to play video games and tabletop games all the time. So easily four hours a night, eight hours on a weekend, because that's how I found my social you know, friends. That's how I spend time over the summer, especially over the summer break. That was a really good time to spend time with my friends. But now as a, I guess, professional mid thirties, um, it's quite hard to align that adult schedule to like, yeah. you know, can we get up together? Oh, when, when are you free next time? Oh, September. <laughs> Literally, we have a board game session with a friend. We've scheduled it in September. This is, this is our lives now. So we've gotten a little too old, a little too busy. And these days we're all feeling a little too tired to have much fun. But according to organizational psychologist and behavioral scientist, Dr. Mike Rucker, author of The Fun Habit, using our exhaustion as a reason not to have fun is only making our burnout worse. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. What is fun starvation? So what I've been looking at is this idea that, especially in adult life, a lot of us aren't engaging in leisure. We're really enjoying the things that we do. And there are a whole host of various headwinds for that, you know, especially depending on the social norms that you live in and sort of where you find yourself in life. But I think what's becoming really apparent is the folks that aren't enjoying the things that they do, at least part of the time, um, are really, you know, ending up burning themselves out. And so in a similar fashion to how we looked at sleep deprivation in, um, kind of in the 90s and 2000s, um, we're starting to now see that with a lack of leisure and fun where, you know, people are, you know, getting, deriving too much self-worth from productivity and want, uh -huh. when they kind of get stuck 
in that um, mode, they don't realize that, you know, they're, they kind of stop enjoying the things around them, right? It comes, becomes this downward spiral. So what's stopping adults in particular from prioritizing or having fun? Yeah, I think there's a whole host of different reasons for folks that find themselves in the sandwich generation, which certainly I do. Mm. I think for the first time ever, you're seeing um, people have kids later in life. And also, I mean, fortunately, but also it comes with some additional responsibilities. Our parents are living longer than they ever have, right? And so Mm. that kind of meets in the middle where um, you know, folks sort of that find themselves between 30 and 50 are now not just taking care of their children, but also taking care of aging parents. Um, you know, the old Protestant Puritan work ethic still at play, right? And then kind of this construct, especially, you know, in Western society where we've been brought up with a meritocracy kind of driving, you know, our self-worth, we really do equate time with money, right? And so if we're sort of wasting time, then somehow our self-worth is, um, you know, degraded, you know? And so when we're sort of idle, you know, somehow some of us have this mental mm-hmm. construct that, you know, we're also wasting money, which is very strange when you, you know, illuminate it, but it, it, it does, you know, because a lot of us will live in this sense of scarcity. If you, if you've kind of, been brought up that way, right? If we're just kind of wasting time, quote unquote, then it can feel uncomfortable. But what we know is that when you live a balanced life, oftentimes an interesting byproduct of, you know, having fun is actually being more productive. And so, Mm. you know, similar to sleep deprivation, which you kind of actualize sooner, you know, right? Like you you go without sleep for a couple of weeks, you know, everything starts to kind of drag. Unfortunately, being fun starved, um, is a little bit more insidious, right? That you can kind of go a month or two and be like, eh, you know, I just need to grind it out and I'll, you know, get that reward at the finish line. But what you don't realize is like slowly but surely, you're just not happy in what you're doing. So your productivity goes down. There's a psychological concept called emotional contagion. So not only is it affecting your, you know, psychological well being, but it's creating an environment where you see poor mental hygiene, you know, around your sort of immediate cohort. So it has all of these ripple effects, but because it's a slow burn, sometimes we don't realize like, wait a second, you know, this actually is a powerful force um, when I'm not enjoying the things that I'm doing. Mm, It's as you were speaking, I was thinking about a friend of mine who's a surgeon, obviously very demanding job and his home life is incredibly stressful as well. And he was saying to me, the other day, I just, I just don't feel like I can be creative at all. Like even when I try to be creative, I can't. And I think it's because he is just permanently stressed. When you are constantly in a state of stress, you cannot be creative. It's kind of like a clenched fist. And to be creative, you need the open fist, the open hand. And I feel like play is the boundary between the two, between stress and creativity, the way to get there the tunnel is play. Would you see it that way? Yeah. So a lot of my academic research has been with physicians. So I have a lot of empathy for, you know, what your um, friend is going through. Unfortunately, you know, I know the U.S. statistics the best, but we're in the worst year ever with regards to physician burnout. And you're spot on, you know, in adulthood, and we should show adults grace. I'm certainly in that cohort, right? we have all of this incoming information. So on top of what I've already shared with regards to the mystic duties that are, you know, um, more complicated than they ever have been, you know, we have the internet, right? We have smartphones, we have, you know, what we call knowledge work now. So we have access to all of these complicated mechanisms sending us so much information that to be able to survive, quite frankly, we need things called heuristics and, you know, essentially a roadmap on how we operate. But the problem is, once we develop all of those algorithms, you're, you're, you're exactly right. We start to lose the ability to think in an, in a way to, in an innovative way to, you know, get curious because we don't have that time. Right. And it's kind of tied into fight or flight. I mean, it's more complex than that, but if you think about it inherently, right, when you're so overwhelmed that you're really just trying to get through the day, you're not trying to think of creative ways to solve those problems. You're just like, I know what I know. And, you know, if I keep my head forward, I can do it. And what's unfortunate there is, again, we start to get depleted, right? Just the same way we need to charge our smartphones and our laptops. If we're not charging ourselves, we don't have anything else to give. 
But paradoxically also, we're not able to kind of think our way out of those problems. And so it does become insidious, right? Where slowly but surely you're getting more depleted, but it's really hard to make that connection unless you you know, start to do a little bit of self-experimentation. The good news is it doesn't take much. I think one of the problems too that um, has made it interesting and is a headwind of truly having fun is that so many of the things that we think are fun are really over taxing our dopamine system, right? And so now what we know- Like what? What are those sort of things? Those things were that are designed for us to anticipate a variable reward. So certainly social media, but, and then, yeah. you know, things like TikTok where um, everything is sort of, you know, this immediate gratification, right? You know, without having to work for it. And so what happens is that we need more and more arousal really to feel like we're enjoying it, but that's not true enjoyment. That's not contentment. It's anticipation of something interesting happening. In his fight to win the attention war, Rob Walker's greatest nemesis may be the smartphone. You get on a train or you're waiting at a bus stop. Everyone is on their phone. Everyone yeah. is just looking. And and um, I, maybe one person sending an important email, but most people are just n mindlessly numbed out looking at something. And yet when you mention the game that you played and you talked about the games that other people play, they're so fun and they're so rewarding and they feel kind of sparky inside us. And yet we keep defaulting to the mind-numbing scrolling that no one leaves mindlessly scrolling Instagram or Reddit feeling sparky and fun and engaged. Why do we keep going back to that instead of doing the thing that you suggested, that sort of mindful, play-based, attention-focused activity? Yeah, I mean, sharper minds than mine have tried to explain this. And um, what the, the consensus seems to be that the thing, well, a lot of what those people on the train are doing is, in fact, literally playing a game, you know, that has been engineered to give short-term attention, like, you know, dopamine rewards for the best time. I, in fact, one of the games that I like to play to, to make this a little bit meta is to look at what people are doing on their phones. I move around the train trying to spy on people. And I remember once <laughs> in San Francisco on the PATH train seeing a guy who, and I looked at it and he was playing a game where you would with your finger like flick a little piece of digital trash into a trash can, like a hmm. little, like sort of like playing basketball. But with, and I was like, what possible reward could you get? But I guess... They tell me that these, uh, they have many experts and people spend a lot of money designing these games in such a way that they give you quick hit dopamine rewards. And the stuff that I'm talking about might not give you quick hit dopamine rewards, or it might, mm. or it might give you a more longer term, like it, it's more of an engagement uh, based uh, activity rather than a sort of quick hit based <laughs> activity. And I, that's the best theory that I can come up with. I, I, I wish mm. I really knew the answer and then I would design a digital game that would make millions of dollars. No, please, no more digital games. That's not what we need. I wonder if it's that staring at our phone is extremely cognitively light. It asks absolutely nothing of us. Even playing the, the rubbish game, it doesn't really require us to engage anything too deep in our brains, whereas your game is fun and interesting and creative, but it does ask something from us. It does ask us to go, okay, what do I do here? What do I think about this? The work, the, the load is in our brain as opposed to in the phone. Right. I think that's right. And I think that that's what I mean when I try to say that these are, that there's a creativity involved in these things that is not, I don't think it's that complicated a creativity, mm. but we build up um, a resistance to it that we don't, as children, it's very natural. You'll just fill in the gaps because you're so curious about everything and the world is just a huge giant adventure box. And by the time you get to be an adult, the world is different. And, you know, I don't want to be cynical, but maybe you're looking for a way out of the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of the situation. And you're looking to, I, the way you put it is good that like this sort of a shift of cognitive load. Like, let me put some of the, let me, let me, let me coast on someone else's creativity and do the digital throw a piece of garbage in the trash can game rather yeah. than go with my own creativity. But I think that my own creativity is actually more energizing. So how do we get that energizing spark back into our lives? 
join us for part two of our series on play next week, when experts will teach us how we play to learn and how to learn to play. Thank you to all our guests on today's episode, Professor Margaret S. Barrett, Dr. Xavier Ho, Dr. Mike Rucker, and Rob Walker. Be sure to check out Rob's newsletter, The Art of Noticing, for a fortnightly jolt of creative inspiration delivered straight to your inbox. We'll put a link in the show notes, along with information about all our guests' work. Thank you for joining What Happens Next. 